Well, as always, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to greet uh, those of you, maybe, who haven't been here for a while. It's very good to see you here this morning. And I, it is my hope and my prayer that uh, through the Word of God, the Spirit of God will minister to your soul, that through the Word of God, the Spirit of God will cause you to see the preciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, His great love for you, His great purpose to work in your heart and in your life to make you more and more like Jesus Christ, uh, that this world might see that God still has a people. He has a people, again, who are called by his name. He has a people from whom he draws out great depths of love. And I hope and I pray that by way of the Spirit of God and his, and his power working upon you, that you come to see and understand that that person that God loves is you, and that person for whom Christ was sent to die is you. I'd like to ask you this morning to take your Bibles and turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter, Galatians chapter 5 as we will continue in our study of this section of God's Word. I hope and I pray again that you have been convinced of its message. Uh, the message that Paul has been preaching uh, throughout this epistle has been very clear. And the, the message is essentially this, that there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Nothing other than Christ can save a soul. Nothing other than Jesus Christ can bring a sinner into the presence of God in a way where that mm -hmm. sinner would be accepted. And the only way, again, that the, that the work of Jesus Christ, the saving work of Jesus Christ, comes to rest upon our soul is through that great gift that God gives us, that gift of faith wherein we act upon what we have heard in the gospel message. We've heard in the gospel message that Jesus Christ died for sinners, and we see and we understand by way of the, by way of the ministry of the Spirit of God that we are those very sinners for, Je for whom Jesus Christ came to die. We understand that the, the world may be full of sinners. We understand that. But we also understand in a very particular way, when all is said and done, there is no sinner like this sinner right here. The gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God causes us to see things in that way. And I ask you the question as you're here this morning, do you understand yourself to be a sinner in need of a Savior? Do you understand yourself to be such a one that if it were not for the grace of God in Jesus Christ, you would be, you would be receiving the due end of all of your works, which is an eternal hell? Did you see what our Lord Jesus Christ spoke here this morning in Matthew chapter 25? How that those, again, who he separates the, the sheep from the goat, those, again, who, who did not, who were not followers of, uh, of him, they go away into everlasting destruction. I hope and I pray that that would be true of none of us here this morning. I hope and I pray that by the grace of God that each of us will respond to this saving message of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Well, what I want to do here today, again, I want to continue on this theme, uh, this great theme that the only way that a sinner can be accepted in the sight of God is through faith alone in Jesus Christ. We we're going to continue on this theme, and what we're going to do here in this fifth chapter is we're going to pick up on where Paul left off last week. You might remember the Apostle Paul was talking in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 10, about the hindrances that Christians face in the, in, in the Christian life. There are these hindrances, there are difficulties that, that beset us sometimes. And what the Apostle Paul was really bringing out was the fact that there were individuals who were infiltrating the church of Jesus Christ. They were bringing a false message, and it was by way of that false message and false doctrine that the Galatian Christians were being troubled. They were being hindered from following Christ fully. And one of the things that I tried to emphasize last week, among a number of things, was essentially this, that, that bad doctrine can hinder you and hinder me in the Christian life. That incorrect understandings of the gospel message are a true hindrance. And the true gospel message, as I've said before, as Paul has been making this case all the way through this epistle of Galatians, is that the only way that we are saved is through Jesus Christ alone, received by faith alone. And so Paul now is going to pick up on this in this, in this present passage. We're going to be looking at, uh, chap at uh, chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. And Paul's going to pick up, once again, the whole matter of those who trouble the church, these troublers of the church. And what he is going to say is essentially this, that all those who twist, tone down, water down, or pervert the message of the gospel, that it is only through faith in Jesus Christ alone who saves, all those who, again, water down that message in order to make the cross less offensive are troublers to the church and will come under the judgment of God. Listen, listen to Galatians chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Listen to what Paul says. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he shall be. 
Verse 11, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were cut off. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. What I want you to see here, again, know what Paul is doing. He is drawing attention once again to these troublers of the church. Who are these troublers of the church? The troublers of the church are those, again, who would set before the church some watered-down message of the gospel. Some way in which a sinner can be accepted in the sight of God apart from the exclusive work of Jesus Christ on his or her behalf. Some watered down message, or I might say it this way, some beefed up message that makes you think that there's something you can do in order to be accepted before God. And what the point that Paul is making here is essentially this. All of those who affect in any kind of way the message of the cross are troublers of the church and will come under the judgment of God. And when they do this, when they water down the church, or when they water down the message, what are they trying to do? They are trying to remove or trying to reduce the offense of the cross. And so this morning, what I hope to do with you from this passage of scripture is to speak to you concerning the offense of the cross. And as I said before, I've already given you my doctrine or my primary point. I'll repeat it here again. All who preach or teach anything other than Christ alone, received by faith alone, in order to remove the offense of the cross, are troublers of the church and will come under the judgment of God. This is a very straightforward, very serious statement, is it not? But this is exactly, as I said before, the point that Paul is making. Just go back to Galatians chapter 5 and, and look what he says. And let's go back to verse 7 now. And notice what he says. He says, he did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse 10 again, Paul says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none, other mind, none otherwise minded. And what Paul is essentially saying this to the Galatians, look, there are these troubles in the church, but I have confidence in you. And the confidence that I have is not a human confidence in your ability, your wisdom, your talents, your gifts, anything like that. This confidence that Paul has is in the saving work of Jesus Christ. I have this confidence in you in the Lord. And aren't you glad that there is such a work of salvation that has this bedrock confidence, this bedrock certainty to it, that all who come to trust in Jesus Christ shall certainly be saved on that last day? Aren't you glad that God is able to keep you through his son, Jesus Christ? And this is the, this is the point that Paul is making here. Yes, there are these troublers in the church. He says, but concerning you, I have this confidence that you will be none otherwise minded. Now, we've made this message in the past. We've made this point in the past. That so oftentimes when Paul is warning the church or the churches, excuse me, or the churches, it is not at all uncommon for him to fall back and, and express some degree of confidence in, his, in uh, the people that he is writing to. He's doing that here and he does it in other places as well. But this confidence I want you to see and understand is not bound up in ourselves. This confidence is all bound up in the work of Jesus Christ for you. Aren't you glad that you can face the end of your days with confidence that God is for you because of Jesus Christ. This is the great, this is the great message of the gospel. And so again, all those who, who water down this message in order to, redo, to, to remove the offense of the cross, again, shall come under the judgment of God. Well, this whole thing about the offense of the cross is something that we, again, as I said before, I wanna, I wanna emphasize this. And the first thing I want you to see and understand about the cross and its offense I want you to make sure that you know and you understand that by way of the gospel, God has purposed and God has ordained that the cross be central in all proclamation of God's saving mercy. That the cross is central. There is what we might say the centrality of the cross. Now the cross you have to understand is the great dividing line of all human destiny. Your eternal state rises and falls on your reaction to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why it's such a, I'll say it, that's why it's such a damnable thing for anybody to water down that message of the cross. That's why it's such a, a horrid thing if anybody would, again, just in order to make the cross more pleasing, remove the offense of the cross. And Paul will have none of it. The, none of it. the church of Jesus Christ should have none of it, none of it as well. But we live in a day when the cross is, again, made, 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 uh, attempted to be made more appealing uh, to sinners, is it not? Remove the offense of, uh, of the cross. Uh, don't speak out so much against sin. Don't call individuals to holiness the, the way that the scripture does. All these things set them, in, set them aside in order that more people might find the cross or the Christian message appealing. Well, that's not what we see in the scripture. 
The offense of the cross is there, and the offense of the cross must remain. Why? Because all those who water down the message of the cross in order to avoid the offense of the cross are troublers of the church. We might think if we make the cross more appealing, more people will come. They may come, but they're not going to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so again, the emphasis that Paul makes is that the cross is central to all of God's saving purposes. Is that how you see the gospel? Is that how you understand your relationship before God? That if it were not for Jesus Christ, oh, where would you be? That if it were not for God's mercy in Christ, how would your end be? And so the cross is central. I want you to see and understand, again, even from the passage of Scripture that we read this morning, that Bob read this morning, how, as I said before, the cross is the dividing line of human destiny. Matthew 25, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The dividing line of all human destiny is the cross of Jesus Christ. This dividing line of human destiny is pictured for us in the Old Testament in so many places. We see it again, that most famous place in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see, again, there is that cross pictured in the Old Testament. And again, you notice again what's happening here. Each one of us has turned everyone to his own way. And we have voices in the church today that say, go your own way. God loves you. It doesn't matter. This is wrong. This is watering down the cross. This is watering down the offense of the cross. And all those who water down the offense of the cross are troublers of the church and will come under the judgment of God. This, the, the cross, by way of its centrality and by way of its essential nature, is uh, fulfilled in the New Testament. If no other place, in that great statement that our Lord Jesus Christ makes on the cross in, in John chapter 19, verse, thir uh, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he, bowed, and, and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. It is finished. The work of redemption is complete. And where is the work of redemption complete? It, if I can say it, I almost hesitate to say it. I, want, I don't want to be misunderstood here. It's not, it's not complete in his life. It's not complete in his teaching. It's complete when he dies on the cross in the place of sinners. All who water down the offense of the cross in order to make the cross more appealing are troublers to the church. And shall come under the judgment of God. This message of the cross and its centrality, this message of, the, this message of Jesus Christ as is, is crucified for sinners, is really the message of angels. It's the message of, of the church. It's the message uh, that, the, that the Father gives approval to. It was the message of, that Jesus Christ himself preached. And it's the message that the church itself ought to preach. Look at these passages of Scripture. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I, saw another, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Give an angel a chance to preach. And what he's going to preach about? The everlasting gospel. Don't water down the, don't water down the gospel. Don't try to remove the offense of it. Uh, declare it before sinners, you see. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. A ransom. Jesus Christ died in your place. Your sins testify against you. Your sins and my sins will bring us to, etern to an eternal hell. But Jesus says, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. Do I see the many here today? Do I see those of you who have, who have responded in faith to Jesus Christ? Don't water down the offense of the cross or try to remove uh, its offensiveness uh, to, 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 to sinners that, that you come in contact with. This idea of Jesus Christ dying in the place of sinners and is, is something, again, that the Apostle Paul says is the very hallmark of what, Paul, of what God himself has done. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? God spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for you. He bore your wrath. He bore your sin. He bore your penalty. Oh, let's, water, let's, let's not water down this message of the cross. The Apostle Paul understood very clearly that when, if, you, if you said to Paul, Paul, reduce your ministry to one sentence. And this is the sentence he would say. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. And understand, that's still something that's with us today. To the, to, the, to, the religious, to the religiously minded, it's a stumbling block. 
It's a stumbling block that there should be somebody to die in my place. You mean my works aren't good enough? You mean my religious ritual with all of its impressiveness? You mean, again, my morality? And you know how things are today with morality. There are people today, there are sinners today who think they're more moral than God is. Isn't that amazing? They call God in the question. They say, why is God doing this and God shouldn't do that? They think they're more moral than God. And they're offended by this message of the cross. Again, as I said before, to those who believe in all this religious ritual, you mean, again, my praying on my knees and my going about with, with sackcloth and ashes, you mean these things aren't acceptable in the sight of God? None of them. You see, Christ and Christ alone. And this message of the cross is that message, it's that message that the Holy Spirit himself puts his stamp of approval on. This, you've heard me mention this passage of Scripture before. I love the passage. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Notice, notice how we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in connection with the preaching of the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, listen, did they minister the things which are now reported among you? Listen, by them who have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. That the Holy Spirit put a stamp of approval on a message. And what is it? It's that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Why would we water down this message? Why would we deceive souls by saying your sin is something that God doesn't care about? Or your sin is something that you don't have to repent of? Or that thing that the Bible says is a sin, God no longer says. Why would we do that? What kind of cruelty do we kind of engage with when we, when we, when we mute the gospel? When those who most need the gospel are not allowed to hear the gospel because it quote-unquote might be offensive to them. All those who remove the offense of the cross are troublers of the church and shall come under the judgment of God. And so again, if you remove the cross from its central place in our acceptance with God and make circumcision, baptism, good works, or anything, uh, in, or anything in the place of the cross, or, or make anything equal to the cross, you have removed the offense of the cross. I want to say that again. If you make anything equal to the cross, you remove the offense of the cross, and you end up with a false gospel. This is what the, this is what the Judaizers were doing. You remember in Paul's day. They, they weren't saying again that you didn't have to believe in Jesus. All good and well with that. Oh, but you also have to be circumcised. And it happens again to, in our own day. There are very few people that are going to tell you to completely turn away from Jesus Christ. Very few people, at least the religiously minded, are going to tell you that. They're going to say, oh yes, Jesus is good for this and Jesus is good for that. But you also have to do this and you have to do that. I'm saying to you, put anything on the par with the cross of Jesus Christ and you have removed the offense of the cross. That's exactly the point that Paul is making in verse 11. He says, and I, if I yet preach circumcision, why am I yet persecuted? And the point that he's making is this. Listen, if I were doing what those troublers of the church were doing, and if I were saying to you, oh, yes, believe in you, and you want to be, be, be circumcised. I, again, just if you, so long as you understand that circumcision is going to add to your salvation, or circumcision is going to be that which is effective for salvation. Paul says, if I did that, I would not be suffering in persecution. And it is kind of interesting when we look specifically uh, at, this, uh, tw at this 11th verse uh, here in, in Galatians chapter 5. It, there's a sense in which we, on the surface, we really don't know what Paul is talking about, but it's easy enough to discern. Look here again. Well, let, let me go. Let's, let's, let's work through verse 10 just a little bit. Look at the second part of verse 10. Paul says, I, I, I'm confident you will be none, none otherwise minded. But notice what he says in the second part. But he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. He that troubles you shall bear his judgment. That's what leads me, again, in my doctrinal statement to say all those who trouble the church, uh, I'm sorry, all those who, who, uh, uh, who, uh, who water down the message of the offense of the cross are troublers of the church. That word there, trouble, means to agitate. It means to, to create doubt. It means to, to unsettle. And the idea here is that these, these Judaizers, the ones that were saying that circumcision was necessary for salvation, they were, again, they were troubling the church. These Galatian believers thought that they were all set by, by simply trusting in Jesus Christ. And then again, these ones, these, these ones who were making a case for religious ritual being, being necessary for salvation, it was causing trouble in the church. But did you notice what Paul says here? He that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he shall be. In our, in our first reading this morning, Bob read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
And in verses 6 and 7, again, Paul talks about those who trouble the church. And he shows how that the judgment of God shall come upon them. It is no light thing to trouble the church of Christ. It is not something that we should think, should think that, that, it's, that it's no big deal. No, God takes, his, God takes the church. Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ is very precious in the sight of Christ. And anybody who unsettles it, anybody who troubles it, again, shall receive this condemnation. In that passage, again, in 2 Thessalonians there, it is a, it's a, if I can say it this way, it's a blistering condemnation that we see. There is no sparing for those who would trouble the church of Jesus Christ. Another passage of scripture that's uh, somewhat similar, it, it, it uses a different picture for the church. It's in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. If you want to just take a uh, turn back a few pages, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, some uh, fairly well-known passage of scripture. Uh, the Apostle Paul, again, talks about this life that we build, built on the foundation of Christ. And notice what Paul says about those who would defile or who would defile the temple of God. Now remember, in 1 Corinthians 3, the church is pictured as a temple. And what Paul says is this, and this is all about this idea of those who trouble the church coming under the judgment of God. 1 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Do you understand the care? And do you understand, if I can say it this way, the loving, holy jealousy with which God and Christ regard the church and all those who trouble the church shall receive their condemnation. This is exactly what Paul is saying here in First Corinthians in Galatians 5, verse 11. Again, he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. That little phrase at the end, whosoever he be, is kind of significant because Paul was echoing what he said earlier in the book of Galatians. If I or an angel preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, what does he say? Let him be accursed. He goes on to say, what did he say about Peter? Remember when Peter was not walking according to the truth of the gospel there in Galatians chapter 2? What did Paul do? Paul confronted him. Why? Because when it comes down to it, it's not the personality that matters. It's the message that matters. And the personalities can be varied. The personalities can be very strong personalities, very weak personalities. But if they are preaching the message of the cross and not watering it down, they have the smile of God. But let those, again, let those water who water down the, uh, the message of the cross in order to remove the offense, they are troublers to the church and shall come under the judgment of God. So again, to mix anything with the uh, finished work of Christ, again, is to trouble the church of Christ. And so again, these troublers of the church. And so the first reason why Paul is so insistent in this passage of Scripture is because the cross is central to all of God's saving purposes. I think I know what most of your religious backgrounds are, but I don't know infallibly. And so I have to ask you, if you'll allow me, to kind of tease this out in your own experience. Are you resting in Christ alone? How many times have I said it in this series? No plan B in your back pocket when you stand before God Almighty on that day. I got this good work that I've done. You've heard me say it. I'm not going to repeat it. No plan B before the, be, 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 before the, before the, the, the judgment seat. No plan B. We were resting in Christ and Christ alone. And so again, the cross is central. And Paul makes this point that the troubles of the church shall come under the judgment of God because the cross is central. The second reason why Paul is so insistent here is because anything that, that destroys or anything that erodes this message, this saving message of the work of Jesus Christ alone is sufficient for salvation. Anything that is allowed to creep into the mind of the individual or into the life of the church robs the individual and the church of the peace that God intends in the gospel. That word again, they trouble you. That's a reference to the mental anxiety that comes upon individuals when that firm foundation that they stand on, which is the finished work of Christ, is now somehow through voices of authority undermined. And those voices of authority might be voices in the church. Doesn't matter what your sin is. Again, in one sense, just come to Christ. This is true. Doesn't matter what your sin is. But when individuals tell you that sin, that the scripture reveals is no longer sin, again, they are undermining all your grounds and all your hope for peace with God. This idea of peace with God is that which belongs to the sinner who comes to Jesus Christ by faith. 
It is a real piece of the soul that is not just uh, that is not just kind of uh, touch, that doesn't just touch upon our externals, but resides deep within the soul. It's a peace that no one can take from us. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ said in John 14, verse 27. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, when the message of the cross is watered down, and when the offense of the cross is removed, the basis and the ground for true spiritual peace is eroded. That's why Paul takes issues with these individuals. And so again, this peace is eroded when we, when we, when we lose that, that sense of the, the exclusive power of Jesus Christ to save sinners. Do you know that really when we take a look at the unsettledness of our souls, that lack of peace, we call it today, rightly so, we call it today our anxieties, our fears that grip us. Do you know that we don't see any mention of fear in the Bible until the first sin of man? It's sin, it's unrighteousness, it's wickedness that brings this unsettledness of soul. You remember the passage in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. And, and, and God is, is calling on Adam and say, Adam, where were you? And Adam says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. There was never any mention of fear in the Bible until this point here. Sin, again, brings that unsettledness. And I'm saying to you, the more we imbibe in sin, and there's even a sense, I have to say this, there's even a sense by way of how God has ordained things, that the more we sin, the less peace we have. It's one of these old, it's one of these old truths, you know. Sin promises more than it can give, and it takes more than it promises. Oh, sin promises you all kind of joy, and it takes joy. It takes more joy than it promised. It's a lie. What's a lie, brother? Sin. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Sin is a lie. What I just said wasn't a lie. Sin is a lie. That's right. So again, we, we lose all that, account, all that ability to have this peace with God when we lose that sense that the cross of Jesus Christ is given to us. And anybody who, who removes that offense is a troubler of the church. Now again, you know that the cross is the only means by which peace is given. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the peace of God. There's peace with God. There's, I'm sorry, there's peace with God. And there's the peace of God. Do you know the peace of God, again, that settles down into the soul? I hope and I pray that you do. Now again... Why, did, why is this message, why is this theme coming up in this passage of scripture? Because these men are specifically referred to as troublers. They trouble the church. And they're related to another group of men that we see in Acts chapter 15, verse 24. Now you remember in Acts chapter 15, that's where you had the whole thing where, where the Judaizers were saying, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Some people today say, except you be baptized, you can't be saved. Except you do this, you can't be saved. Except you join my church, you can't be saved. Except you do all kinds of things. And they're watering down the message of the gospel. These men were troublers. And this is exactly what the text of Scripture says. In Acts chapter 15, verse 24, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Now, this is kind of interesting because what you have here in this 15th chapter of Acts, you have the church at Jerusalem upholding that gospel that Paul preached. And while there were very many in the Jerusalem church that were zealous for the law, that were zealous for the law of Moses, and while you had many in the church of Jerusalem, again, that were very observant by way of the customs of the Jews, yet they did not make the mistake to say that those customs or those laws add anything to salvation. And if, and, if, and if somebody from a Jewish descent wanted to continue on by way of what his Jewishness looked like, that was fair enough. But to misconstrue those external rites as having something to do with salvation, that's a trouble. You see, and this is, and again, we can, we can make so many uh, applications of this in our own day. But anyway, I want you to see and understand here that the reason why Paul is so insistent that nobody watered down the offense of the cross is because when the offense of the cross is taken away, all of your ability for peace of soul is eroded along with it. Therefore, Paul says, all those who trouble the church shall come under the judgment of God. The third thing that I want you to see, and this is kind of, this is, we have to maybe proceed a little cautiously here, but I want you to hear this. We've seen again that the cross is central. You've seen again that the cross is the means by which God 
has ordained that we have peace with him and, and all those who trouble the church remove those grounds of peace. The third thing I want you to see is this, is that the cross, the reason why the offense of the cross cannot be removed is because the cross is designed to offend you. To offend you. You and I come to the cross as broken. We don't come to the cross as analyzing. Well, you know, I don't know if that was really sufficient. And, you know, crucifixion was real common back in that day. And, you know, if this didn't... No, the cross is designed to break you and me. And in a very way that... that that the natural man sees as foolishness, that cross, which is designed to offend us, to break us down in its presence, is the very instrument and the very means through which God gives life. It's in the cross that we have this life. It's coming to the cross, that we come to the cross broken. Now, there are many passages of Scripture that bring this out. But the cross, as I said before, is designed to destroy the pride of man. That's why the cross is an offense. To religious pride, it says, why shouldn't my sacrifice be accepted in the sight of God? Isn't that, uh, isn't that what Cain said? Why shouldn't my sacrifice be accepted in the sight of God? It's, it's again, designed to strip us from kind of depending on anything other than the finished work of Christ. The intellectual man, stop and think of the difficulty the intellectual man has. Let me see if I get this right. So you have a savior, you say, this one who was delivered to deliver you from death. And, and what did man do to him? Oh, man put him to death. So let me get this right. The one who was to deliver you from death was put to death by man. And you know what the natural man says? Sounds to me like, like man won. And then God uttered his great voice, if I can say it that way. And then God raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we hear again every true Christian in whom the, the gospel has come home to. We say, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. But again, I want you to see that the, that the cross is meant to break us down, as it were. The cross is meant to offend. This is why in the, in, in the scripture, we read our Lord Jesus Christ saying this in Luke chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Listen to what he says. He says, and he beheld them and said, what is it then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. And whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. And, whosoever, and on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him the powder. Do you see again, Jesus Christ is that great dividing line. If we fall upon that stone, yes, we will be broken. The cross is designed to break us from our pride. But if that stone falls upon us in judgment, we shall be ground to powder. Oh, you see, this, these attempts to water down the offensiveness of the cross, again, are something that we should, be, that we should, uh, that we should again, call out and make sure never uh, uh, creep in uh, to, our, to our understanding of the gospel or creep in even to the teaching of this church, if I can say it that way. Notice another passage of scripture where we see this intention of God to offend by the cross. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 13 and 15, we read the following, and this passage is taken up in the New Testament. The Lord Almighty is the, is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, listen, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. I ask you the question, do you stumble at the person of Christ? Do you stumble at a message that makes you, that makes you rely wholly and completely on Jesus Christ? And again, I'm saying to you, if, if that's your response to it, oh, check your heart. Go to this one again who breaks you and who removes you from all of yourself, from all of your self-righteousness and all of your spiritual pride and rest wholly and completely on him. God is doing this, again, in order that we might see ourselves and our great spiritual need before him. Romans chapter 9, verse 32, Paul says this concerning the Jewish nation. He says this, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but, but, but as it were, by the works of law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And so again, the purpose of God in setting forth the Lord Jesus Christ is that sinners might indeed 
be broken off of their sin. And any attempt to water that down is it, it to, in order to remove the offense of the cross, again, is a message that troubles the church and does our souls no good. So do you understand what's happening here? The cross is designed in a very real way to offend all those who reject it. And you and I must make sure that when it comes to this preaching of the cross, that whatever we may have been offended by in the cross, we now, like the Apostle Paul, glory in it. And how do we do that? By understanding that if it were not for Christ, we could not be saved. And so this cross, which is designed to break the pride of man, is also the same cross that is designed to bring salvation to sinners. Oh, I hope and I pray that you have come to understand the cross of Jesus Christ in this way. So again, the cross is central. To, to remove the offense of the cross is to undermine the peace that God intends through the cross. The cross, in a very real way, is set forth as a stumbling block that sinners might fall upon Jesus Christ and be saved and not be ground when Jesus Christ comes in judgment. But the last thing I want to say here is this. Because all those who water down the offense, for, because of all those who change the message of the gospel away from the exclusive trust in Jesus Christ in order to make the message of the gospel more palatable or less offensive and they water it down, these individuals are troublers of the church and shall come under the judgment of God. That being the case, let us make sure that as individuals and collectively as a church that we will never seek to remove the offense of the cross. When you witness to your friends, don't tell them that their sin is okay. When you witness to your friends, don't fail to emphasize how serious a matter sin is. When you witness to your friends, as much as you are trying to compel them and to plead with them to come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ, don't manipulate the cross. Don't attempt to make the cross more appealing. We have a gold cross here. Look at this gold cross. That, that, that's not the real cross. The real cross was, a, was an instrument of shame and degradation. And when we preach the cross, we're not preaching a gilded cross. We're preaching a cross upon which a Savior died. And should we attempt to remove the offense of the cross, we too will be troublers of the church and we too will come under the judgment of God. Do you understand why Paul says again, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so may we as a church of Jesus Christ, may we determine to know nothing among men other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm saying to you, this is an offense to the world. Last night, last evening, you got, each of you got an email. I, I came across that news article where that, that young man in Arizona was street preaching and he was shot in the head. I didn't get it. I didn't have any more. Uh, I don't have any more uh, information. You may have more information than me. Don't know if it was deliberate. Seems to be. Don't know if it was inadvertent. Doesn't seem to be. But here's a man that was preaching. And one of the bystanders said that the guy was always out there preaching. People would curse at him, do this and say this and say, man, I was shot in the head. The cross offends. The cross offends. If this man was preaching the true gospel, what was he saying? He was saying that sin brings judgment and that God, again, is angry with the wicked every day. But God, through his son, Jesus Christ, has made a way of atonement and reconciliation. It's an offense. You see, again, the world hates this message and the tendency of the church is to water it down in order to remove the offense. But I come back to the doctrine. All of those who water down the gospel message in order to take away its offense are troublers of the church and shall come under the judgment of God. Let us be clear in what the gospel is. Let us embrace it and let us receive, let us receive it wholeheartedly. Let us live again under its authority. Let us again live in a way that we are called to as a result of it. And let us live in such a way that we will not be ashamed of the cross, even though the world may hate us for it. But by God's grace, we shall stand. And we will say with the Apostle Paul once again, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of, of, of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father.
Give us grace, we pray. This glorious message that you have given the sinners, this message again which breaks the pride of man, which the proud heart not only hates, but the proud heart even attacks. Give us grace, we pray, Lord God, as individuals to understand that the offense of the cross must never be, must never be watered down. And may we, as a church, be faithful to that message no matter what the cost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>